I'm B. And I'm B. And, and this, this is Homestead, Homestead Happenings. Happenings. Where every week we bring you along on our journey to self-sufficiency. And bring you exclusive interviews on all things Homestead from people around the world. So hit subscribe and follow along with us. Let's learn. Let's, let's grow. Let's, let's go. go. I'm B. And I'm B. And today we are going to talk about homesteading for seniors aging while homesteading, one may say. So today I am sitting here with Victoria. She's been super nice to us. We've had so many things going on and she's been so flexible. So today uh, she's come on to discuss with us homesteading as you're aging. Now they are not you know, over 70, like what some people, their mind, when they think homesteading for seniors, they're going to 70, 80 years old. But actually, this all starts the prep well before that. When you get your systems in place, even in your 40s, you'll want to be thinking ahead to the future. So I'm going to go ahead and pass the torch over to Victoria, and she's going to tell us first um, what they do on their homestead how old they are, and then we're going to dive into meaty details. So, Victoria, take it away. Let's hear about you. All right. Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, we're, our homestead's called Shady Farm, uh, and uh, I am 52 years old. My husband's 62 years old. Uh, and I agree with you first and foremost, and I know we'll get into that in a bit, but um, that, that planning for the future is absolutely essential because we want to be here farming another 20 years. And in order to do that, it, it informs everything we do, even just the site placement, where the garden went, how close the barn is to the house and all that kind of stuff. So, um, But here on the farm, we have a big market-sized garden. We have a small orchard uh, with apple, peach, pear, pawpaw, hazelnut. Uh, nectarine, plum, you get the idea. Um, and we have 20 goats right now, seven milking does, uh, and a bunch of babies that we spent the summer doing goat yoga with, which I would love to talk about because it was wonderful, 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 and a great um, source of revenue for the farm. Um, and I make cheese, uh, lots of different types of goat cheese. Uh, we have Nigerian dwarf goats. Um, the reason I picked them is they're very easy to manage because they're little, but more importantly, they have the highest butter fat quality of any goat milk. So it's the best best milk for cheese. You don't get as much milk every day as you would with, say, a Nubian or an Oberlahasi or a La Mancha. But the milk quality is so good that the cheese I make is just insanely delicious and beautiful. Yeah. I make complicated ones sometimes, like, you know, St. Mar and... Uh, brie and camembert but most of the time because i'm so busy because most of this i'm doing myself my husband's still working which is another thing i'd love to talk about um i just mainly do like yogurt feta chef ricotta um and the sort of simpler cheeses i don't have to deal with aging and penicillin wine and all that stuff so uh that's it we're yeah. on 50 acres in woodstock new york also Yes, and you know, New York is so beautiful. I've seen properties in northern New York, and yeah. I'm just like, man, that is just stunning. Um, the fall right now is utterly insane. I've never seen it this gorgeous. The, the leaves are just popping. It's incredible. Yes, and we're down here in the Ozarks, and you know, um, I know a lot of people are avoiding the East Coast for maybe restrictions or this and that, but there is just stunning old charm over there, and not yeah. all of the East Coast is the city, and I hope people realize that it is not all the inner city and really <laughs> give some of those areas a chance. So, I mean, you brought up your husband is still working. That's an excellent jump off point as well as the goat yoga. So especially as you're aging, you're talking about income and things. So we can dive right into that. Um, let's talk about the revenue and how that's functioning. Uh, yeah. And just to go back to what you said about not all the East Coast is inner city, just the upside of being in the Hudson Valley is that it's beautiful and it feels rural. But it's also got a lot of arts, a lot of chamber music, a lot of rock and roll music. Like, it's just, it's kind of this perfect blend of, of everything. It's it's very, very cool. So, um, but just because I love it so much. Yeah. I say that. <laughs> um, well, so, you know, we were going to talk about, well, so, so finances are huge, right? So we're looking at um, how much does the farm cost? Because right now I am just a farmer. I used to be. 
uh, an acupuncturist and herbalist in the city as well as a yoga teacher in Manhattan. Um, but I'm up here full time and have been for quite some time. Um, and I'm running the farm more or less by myself, which is definitely another conversation. But, you know, the main thing we look at now is, you know, how can we get the farm to pay for itself? Some profit would be fantastic too. Um, but we're small and we're retired and I'm not trying to have a, a giant dairy business. So the main thing is how do we not hemorrhage money uh, in a way that at some point, you know, in a reasonable time frame, my husband could go ahead and retire. So uh, that's why the goat yoga has been so wonderful because it's an incredible source of revenue that has pretty modest overhead. Uh, people absolutely love it. It sells itself. Uh, and because I used to teach yoga, I don't even have to hire anyone to do that, so I could just do it. Um, and I love the babies, and, you know, we have mats around the country, generally speaking, with a notable exception of Florida, go for about $45 per student. So, I mean, if you've got 20 students in a class before expenses, you know, that's $900 per class in potential farm revenue. Um, and that seasonal, so, you know, it's June, July, May, June, July, August, September, and part of October, but that's not an insubstantial amount of money, and what we found this year is that it's basically going to pay our expenses. It's going to pay for hay and feed and upkeep and all that, and that's amazing, okay. especially given it's a first-year business. So exactly, I mean, that's you know. huge, and I'm assuming, you know, there's going to be liabilities and people just, you know, they'll look into that. Do you have to have um, anything other than your insurance over there? I know where we are, it's very loosey-goosey. We don't have to have a lot of things. I would just do insurance, of course, probably to protect myself, but they actually right. don't require it. Well, we have farm insurance, and our farm insurance, when we originally talked about what we were going to ask for and priced it out, Part of that is includes classes, uh, so the goat yoga can fall under classes, and so therefore we're insured through our farm policy. Perfect. Um, and that's plenty for New York State. Now, some yoga teachers take out insurance for themselves, but I feel pretty covered with that farm policy that I don't need to take an additional coverage out. If I had someone working for me as a yoga teacher, then I would just make sure that they were insured, but most yoga teachers in New York are insured. And what is your husband, what would he be retiring from? Well, he was an emergency physician for many, many years, uh, and then he ran a hospital system, and now he's actually the provost of uh, a university up here, um, and he's provost and chief operating officer, and um, and remember, you know, retirement for us is still a ways away, but it's just something we enjoy talking about, but mm -hmm. you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a minute. <laughs> so. Yes. Well, and you mentioned something, I went over your questions, you know, and it's also just huge. So many people aren't thinking about the money that they're going to need in 20 years. They're thinking, oh, oh my bills are covered now, and that's just right. not acceptable. No, and I mean, I don't want to, you know, dredge up anything, but, you know, whether Social Security is going to be there by the time I can collect it remains to be seen, right? So Yeah, and I think most of our listeners are with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, you just got to be realistic, and I want to be able to feed my animals and make sure that I'm not eating cat food when I'm 85. Exactly. So. And so that that's just so important, regardless of what you're doing, you know, um, us personally, we've had all kinds of financial um, mess. And in reality, it'd be great to be debt free doing all this. You see it all the time. People are watching YouTube, listening to stuff and everybody's debt free. Um, that's actually not the case for a lot of people. So, sure, we, of course. so um, you know, we just are trying to work hard and get there in something that has to be on our conscious mind, especially me with a health condition is, is that money set aside? I'm even younger. My, I'm 31. My husband's 32. So I can guarantee you there's probably not going to be nothing for us. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. But the other thing is, is you guys have time, which is fantastic, right? Yes. So we're looking, we're looking down the end of a gun barrel in a way, right? So if, yeah. if we want to retire, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, our ability to earn an income uh, is you know, is, is winding down in its own way. I mean, sure, some people work until they're 90, but... Right. Blah, blah, blah. But, <laughs> and, and so, you know, there's, there's that. But then also we talk about things like, and I know you're pressed for time, so I won't, um, I won't ask you too many other, 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 right? But I, if, 
you know, you're happy with your location, which we learned that already, and you're yeah. loving the revenue streams. You guys are preparing. You've got 50 acres. All this is amazing. But is family close by? Is this a concern as you age to be alone, or is it important to have family nearby? Um, you're welcome to ask me other and other and other. I, had, I do have some time, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, we've got family. So, uh, my husband has four kids. So I have four stepchildren. Um, and the youngest just went off to college. So he's in Boston. My step, my another stepdaughter is in college in Connecticut. Uh, and then two others are working and living in Manhattan. Wow. So that's all a really reasonable distance from us. Um, they're all coming for Thanksgiving, which we're incredibly excited about. They love being here. I mean, it's an entertaining place to be between the baby chickens and the goats yeah. and the dogs and the hiking and the coyotes. I mean, it's for them, they're kind of suburban kids, not kind of, they're very suburban kids. So this is like a wild ride every time they come. Yeah, they get their um, own farm experience part-time. <laughs> <laughs> they do. And, you know, I take them fishing and we go out on the Ashokan Reservoir. I mean, it's just a sort of endless bunch of things to do. Um, so we're pretty happy that they're around, and, you know, they're young people. They need to go off and do their thing, so to speak. Um, my parents have passed, so that's not of concern to me. Um, and my husband's parents are elderly in Florida, but they're happy in Florida. So, you know, and they're, and they're doing fine. They're taking care of so. That's good. You know, I think, that's it. I think having family or some type of community or something, you know, around us, there's um, a few older gentlemen that I saw that have been using Facebook, which it was neat uh -huh. to see. They learned to use that. And they were asking, um, is any, does anybody young want to come and assist me with X, Y, Z? And in exchange, uh, um, you know, they were gaining the knowledge. They were sharing product. Right. Um, and, right. and that's just something so huge. And people jumped. I mean, their comments were crazy full of people that's in their awesome. 20s and 30s that wanted to go out and have firsthand experience. And I think that's important. If anybody's listening and you're just getting started, reach out to your 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 4-H kids, your FFA kids, your, um, you know, maybe post on your social media. They're, they're wanting to learn. They're craving that. And yeah, it also absolutely. helps you because then, you know... It just, it works. Well, there's a girl that I'll be having um, come out and help me. She is just suburban, and um, she just said, can I lend a hand? And with everything yeah. that I get behind on, and it's just amazing. Um, with That's actually how I learned to do all the things that I'm doing uh, is I volunteered. So I just called a bunch of farms and found, talked to friends, and I volunteered just about every weekend for three years at a goat dairy farm, and I worked at Nubians, I worked on a hog farm, uh, and I worked on a chicken operation, both egg laying and meat birds, because, you know, you need to find out if yes. you really want to do this. I mean, I, I have a, a friend, bless her heart, uh, who lived in the city her whole life and done pretty well for herself and dreamed of a farm and read all these books and got all excited and went out and bought herself 40 acres in rural North Carolina, and it did not go well. <laughs> she, didn't, yeah. she didn't realize, you know, there's a romance to having a farm, but, you know, at the end of the day, there's also flies and mud and illness and chickens that need to be killed and, like, you yeah. know, it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful lifestyle, but it can be really, really rough, and she, she called me one night, she was like, it's so quiet out here, how do you deal with it? And I was like, that's what I love, sweetheart, like, yeah. you know, I, but I she had an idea of what it was going to be, and it ended up being something completely different, so she sold it and... and, and threw it in by about two years. I would say that, um, you know, I had this experience, um, recently as recent as this week, we, everybody says do quail. We've got other poultry. We love them. Uh, we're a poultry breeder, you know, like oh, cool. but we get these quail eggs. I'm excited. We get them from my sharp uh -huh. farm. They get here. I incubate them. I tell you what, I brooded those bad boys overnight and they were gone. Uh, oh. they were just not for me. They were super <laughs> fragile, super loud. Um, yeah. there, there's so many things. And so I think that the idea of go see people, go touch for them, sure. talk to them. That is a huge, huge thing. And, um, I teach on rabbits and I really wish, you know, there was a lot of people who took, who bought my book. Um, for those of you interested, you can find that on my website. Um, and they bought my book, they sat in on my talk and everything was great. And a lot of them said, well, 
I actually think these are going to be more maintenance than I anticipated. I really appreciate your book and I'm not going to be raising rabbits. Right. And that is a huge thing because all these little yeah. livestock, it becomes romanticized with the babies and then you're not ready. And I'm yeah. not, I'm not even immune to that. So well, um, even the dairy, I mean, I had this idea that I wanted to make cheese and I was really excited about it, but I went and had to work in a dairy because I was like, it's controlled rotting and milk. I might walk in there and the smell might be like, oh my God, it's so nauseating. Yeah. I walked in and the smell was glorious, but like, you don't know how you're going to react to that until you do it. Yeah. We have La Manches and Nubians and I'll tell you, our, oh, nu- nice. our Nubians are loud. <laughs> like I probably, had I known how loud they were. I honestly yeah. might have went pure La Mancha, but they're so yeah. sweet. Like, they're, yeah. you know, so it's, it's just a toss up. I would like yeah. to make hard cheeses. And so what I ah, have yeah. done is I've been following and communicating with people who have goats who are doing the hard cheeses. And let me tell right. you what, that is definitely going to be a process. Right. Yeah. So sure. but that's, you know, that just goes back to learning. Um, I will say you mentioned okay, this matters on where we set this up, where we set that up. So a huge thing, people will want to, you know, they're coming at me and they say, ask her when you do this about her garden, because we don't anticipate having livestock long-term, but the garden is a huge thing. So of course everybody knows, okay, you do raised beds and that will bring (laughs) that up. What what are you saying realistically for people who are aging long-term who want to raise significant gardens i mean what do we do there well okay so i looked at raised beds but our garden is so large because our goal is to grow all of our own food for the year right Right. so you know we've got beans and winter squash and you know potatoes and cabbage and you know that's a substantial amount of food and i looked into raised beds and it was just going to be insane um so to get them i'm also five foot ten so to actually get them at a level yeah. that I was, that, you know, that w- was a good bend for my back, I and mean, I was going to have to have like, you know, three and a half foot, four foot bed, uh, and that was, you know, filled with soil made of whatever it is, you know. And I just looked into it, and I was like, well, this isn't going to happen. I mean, it's like you know, tens, of, tens of thousands of dollars to set up. Uh, so what I did was I did I had um, I had thirty. Uh, is this right? Is this 30? I have 30 20 foot beds, 30 25 foot beds to give you an idea of how big the garden is. I think it's um, very important what you said about tens of thousands of dollars. And you know what? I yeah. can tell you right now, there's listeners, I, I already can feel it. And they're saying, What? All you needed to do was do no till, do rows, do this, do that. And I would like to remind listeners, we will get into gardening soon. But just remember, there's other people like my mom is doing this um, and, and she's in urban setting and she's trying to do gardening. And for them, having things mismatched or in containers or things like that, um, some people just genuinely don't find that aesthetically pleasing. They just want it to look orderly. They want it to look a certain way. Um, maybe straw is not available in these areas. It's just sometimes... It's not realistic for everyone. So when people hear in-ground beds, let's not turn our nose up at that because it is a very uh, real possibility for a lot of people. I appreciate that. That's very nice of you. It's also wonderful to get these different perspectives. I just thought it was a just doing, you know, just buying soil, building my beds, and having just regular garden beds was just the way to go simply because the options that I was aware of did not seem affordable to me at the time, which was, you know, to have enough raised beds to raise a year's worth of food, but the raised beds were literally at my hip level because anything yeah. else doesn't help me at all. Yes, um, and, <laughs> and I, I have them myself. We built the three foot, I've got, uh, they're six, I got a, a 12 by four and a six by three, and they stand at two feet tall. I right. am five six, so it's not too <laughs> bad, but I'll tell you what. Um, yeah. the filling of those without doing it Hugo culture style, I would, would right. not be able to afford to do it. I just can't. Right. The thought of everybody getting these farms, especially at, in their fifties or plus and being able to fill these with pure soil ready to go would be an right. absolute financial undertaking. And that's just unrealistic. Right. 
Yeah, and remember the square footage of my bed. I mean, I, I'm sure someone smarter than me could calculate it, but, you know, again, I've got 30, 30 rows that are 25 feet long that are, I believe, 17 inches between each row and 34 inches across. So, like, that's exactly. a crazy amount of garden. Like, that's a market-sized garden, and I don't, I'm sure there are lots of people out there doing Google culture for that kind of thing, but it just, yes. you know, anyway. It's not one size fits all. And so... You doing that also affords other things. Uh, do you utilize any type of drip irrigation? Well, that's what I was about to say. So I, I landed on drip for all the obvious reasons. It's, you know, it's very conservative. You use less water. Mm-hmm. But it means I'm not toting water. So like mm-hmm. when we were talking about doing this podcast, I mean, one of the things that I was talking about with aging is, you know, the setup of the place, um, but the things that you need to worry about, which is finances falling and hauling water, Yep. right? So when I need to irrigate my garden, I flip something. <laughs> my beautiful Dripworks system kicks in, uh, and then I, you know, I have it in sections because, again, the garden is so large, I can't do it on one, you know, I have it in, in different sections, so then I just put it on another pipe, but that saves me a lot of time and a lot of work um, and also saves a lot of water, so that's what I did. And it's and I absolutely love it. Oh, um, yeah. We're working on hard, hard, excuse me, hoses in the barn, um, which of course we can't do in the winter. Um, but hauling water in the summer, at least, we made a little bit easier by having troughs and hoses. But in the winter, it's just buckets, right? Three three gallon buckets, five gallon buckets, and in the ice with crampons on. <laughs> which, <laughs> you know, so. And we are off grid. We have no running water, so we haul five gallon buckets constantly. And let me tell you, off grid friends listening, we too can have drip irrigation. And I will be doing hoses, and also we will be right. setting up drip into some beds um, this this spring. And essentially, same thing. We can just do it gravity fed, smarter, not harder. Very so cool. just people think drip, and they're like, "Oh, I couldn't do it without water lines." Not true. Right. We'll be able to do that. But you're right. Um, just the water savings alone is huge. Yeah. And yes, you mentioned falling. That's another thing. I think people need to be mindful of what kind of ground they have here in our area. Uh, the white rock is very popular and I cannot tell you not even on both hands, how many times we've fallen. So, uh, we will be, it's a big deal. Falling is a big deal. I've fallen a couple times pretty hard on the farm and it's just like, damn, if I do this just slightly harder, I would be out of commission potentially for quite some time. And then who's going to do what? So, so we are going to have to mitigate that moving forward. And, you know, we've talked about putting up some railings and some things like that over time. Um, a, our property is slanted when we get our ice storms, which are about to start mm-hmm. pretty soon. It's almost right. impossible to walk last year. Actually, I was in a section and I had to crawl because I could not get grip when we had like three inches of ice. And so we're like, no, so we're going to do string lines and things where we need to be. And people have to think about this. How is your farm set up? Do you have hills? If you've got cows, you know, 20 acres away from you, how are you going to get there? Realistically, walking back and forth over and over when you're 75 years old is not going to be a, a plausible plan. Um, I've got a question for you about the ice. So do you use spikes on your muck boots? So, do you have those things? So actually, a good question. At the time, uh, I wasn't able to wear those, and it was actually a cleaning injury. Um, and so oh. I was only able to wear certain shoes and okay, okay. and so we had that now um another good thing you brought up is you need to have that stuff here on site and ready because it wasn't right. until the end of winter that i even learned about that because where we were from right. was more flat and we just didn't have to deal with it we never heard of people dealing with it the ice storms here it was not even supposed to rain and next thing you know we had three inches of ice on the ground yeah yeah so it's that's another huge thing. Make sure you look at your resources or things to make things easier. They've got heated jackets now. I mean, if you yeah. can, if you can do some of these things now, what yeah. ways do you simplify animal care for the winter time, especially? Uh, well, we try to consolidate every, consolidate everybody into the smallest space possible. Um, obviously we do deep litter bedding just cause that's our heat for the barn. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're, our water source, our frost proof pump is right outside the front of the barn door. So there's as little outdoor walking as possible. 
Um, we get ice here frequently, and it'll just be ice for many, many, many weeks on end. So we have every different variation of crampon and spike for our boots, because you, you couldn't walk 10 feet out of the north side of our house to get to the barn without falling and breaking a hip. Like, it's really... It's, oh, it's, it's Catskills in the winter. I mean, there are places that have way worse winters than us, but we just, we get a lot of ice where we are. So, Did you ever but think the main thing is water. So, consolidating yeah. water, making sure your frost proof pump is right by the barn door. Um, we were advised not to put it inside because then if it does burst, then it's a whole thing. We do have concrete in part of our barn, so. <clears throat> I would say, what, um, did, you know, I asked, uh, one of the questions was, how does your climate change anything? It sounds like you love your location and people's first thing is always, I'm going to go to the South. I'm going to go to the mm. South and Homestead. I'm going to do this. Uh, but you know what? I bet you deal with much less on the pest um, and disease side than we do here where it's so hot and humid. But right. I think it's about you either love your location or you don't. I think winter is something that you just are going to have to deal with. And it sounds like you're happy where you are, but if the opportunity arose, do you think you'd go south? Well, I grew up in the south. So I grew up in North Carolina and Virginia. Um, my family has a huge farm in North Carolina, and we've got two other farms, my cousins and such, have two other farms in Virginia. Um, and I love visiting them in the summer, but I can't handle the heat anymore. I mean, maybe it would change if I moved back, um, but I've been... I've been living up north as a Yankee for 25 years, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I find those 98 degree days, 100 degree days, I can't function. So, I mean, unless, I mean, I suppose I could change my lifestyle a lot and, you know, go out and then just come in in the middle of the day. But, you know, I remember growing up and my relatives would have little mini heat strokes and major heat strokes and all that other stuff because it's, as you know, it's hot. So, you yep. know, <laughs> if I had to pick between a boiling summer and a, and a really cold winter, I'll take a really cold winter in any day, but that's also my preference, right? Somebody else might be like, why on earth am I going to shovel snow when I can have a longer, you know, growing season? Are you crazy? Right, but you know what? I thought to myself briefly, uh, and it goes right to what you said, we came from the north, um, uh -huh. I, more north. I mean, it was, it was Nebraska, and so <laughs> where we were, it wasn't uncommon to have feet of snow. Like, <laughs> that was normal. You know, we're like, we're going to go south, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, what happened? Well, we just went through two... Well, we're going to be going into our third summer. We've not had air uh -huh. conditioning. Oof. And let me tell you what, 115 <laughs> degrees, no air conditioning, 90% oh, humidity is like about wow. to just kill me off. And, you know, I told... <laughs> and my husband said it too. Um, we're like is shoveling that bad you know i mean to, to do a you could if you're gonna heat a we here we couldn't grow all year round for a lot of things we would need a heated greenhouse right. well heck if you're already gonna have a heated greenhouse you could have heated that bad boy in the north you know and we could have dealt with a lot less parasites and um pest pressure in the north um and uh, one bad thing is, is I think the North figured that out and their property prices are outrageous. <laughs> so, yeah. so, but I think that's just very important. People need to realize as you age, the heat is going to crush you. For real, for real, really. It's a big difference between the way I can handle heat at 22 and the way I can handle heat at 52. It's a really big difference. Yeah. So I would say, yeah, definitely that's going to play a role. And then... Um, you know, as far as like harvesting and preserving and stuff like that, you know, that stuff, you can, you can make all those things easier by doing it on a schedule or taking your time or, you know, whatever, but you can't change full placement. You can't change some of these things. It just is better figure out what you can handle long term and, and do it that way. So what I would say is what goals do you have, I know you're doing the goat yoga and I know, you know, your husband wants to come home and things like that, but, and you want to grow your food for yourself. Is there any other goals that you want to do or are you hoping to oh, be like, ah. yes. So I think you get my point of my question there. I'm not sure if I asked it very well, but. <laughs> well, so I'm going to answer it and tell me if I get, if maybe I didn't get your question, but so I, I'm, I am super psyched to do way more than we're doing. It's just that I'm at full bandwidth with the market-sized garden, 
the laying operation, the goat yoga and the mm. cheese making and, you know, birthing the goats in the spring. Holy moly. Okay, so, right. Uh, so it's all me. Uh, once my husband's here, um, what I'd really love to do is expand. I really want to make sure we have a lamb operation. We know exactly where we're going to put them uh, and how we're going to have them. <clears throat> I would really like to expand to have a meat bird operation. So right now I still work at other poultry farms that are owned by friends around um, and part of the way that we burn our chicken is we do trades all summer with you know cheese and yogurt and dairy products um, but also when it's season I go and you know I spend three days uh, processing poultry with them and then I bring home some of those chickens and that goes into our freezer so uh, and same with the lamb so we are getting chicken and lamb locally from our farms as trades or as just you know the fruits of my labor but ultimately we would like to have those operations here on site and we have space for them and we know what we want to do we even have a tractor <laughs> a really yeah. couple of nice really great tractors for meat birds because we were going to do them this year and i woke up one morning and i was like i cannot possibly take on meat birds because that's the other thing about homesteading is everyone says oh you know it only takes like five minutes a day that is both true and not true mm -hmm. and that five minutes a day if you multiply it into you know 47 tasks suddenly it's overwhelming and you can't get it done uh, and then also, you know, if the fence is down, et cetera, et cetera, and something comes up, it's going to take five hours of your hard labor. Again, everything can be thrown off because suddenly everything only takes five minutes, but then suddenly you haven't done any of it because you had to fix the fence or whatever it was. You're, you know what? That is a truer statement has never been said. Uh, <laughs> we have been, as you know, you had to be flexible because we had the vet and, you know, all of those things. Of course, I had anxiety attack, crying, everything. You were oh, so sorry. kind. But because of that, right. there was a ripple effect. Things had right. to be pushed. And, you know, uh, the whole it takes five minutes and then five minutes by yeah. 45. You're surely yeah. right. And another thing that people need to keep in mind, I, like I've mentioned here, I do have a health condition. And so my chores, when I'm doing these chores... We have chickens, ducks, goats, pigs, rabbits, dogs, cats, and it takes me like an hour to an hour and a half to do the full yeah. chores properly. And right. then, you know, that's just morning. We know we got night, we got right. afternoon, and if it's the summertime, you got an extra one. Now, my husband, right. he does not have a health condition, and so he can get chores done in like 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> so it's going to... You know, people have to think about that. And, you know, you're like, I'm doing everything, you know, myself pretty much. Well, um, people go into it and don't realize, oh, man, what about the days that so-and-so can't help me? Right. What about the days so-and-so is sick? And then... Well, I finally got COVID and I was sick as a dog and I still had to go out and milk. And yeah. there was no one else to do it because my husband still hasn't. And that is a whole other conversation to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to my great irritation, he's promised me he's going to learn next spring, but to my great irritation, he has not learned to milk yet, so that was just going to be me no matter what, so well, drag my ass out of bed with a fever and whatever and go out there and milk the goats, that yeah. was the only answer. And as soon as it's done, you know, then I'm like, you know, there's things I can put off. I could put off a food preservation, I could put off a, a harvest for a day or so, but I cannot put off feeding, watering, nope. hay, and so people have to think about that. And, you know, it seems like when people say only add one thing a year or add two things a year, yes, I, know, yes. I know it seems long and we, yep. and we didn't do that and I wasn't sick. And then when I got sick, I already had everything and you okay. know things were already started and, you know, we were already having birds of age so we could, you know, be selling stuff. We were already in talks for things. Um, we were all over social media and people have noticed, huh, you don't post on your YouTube. But that's because the videos, um, it just wasn't feasible. Something had to go. So, I, uh, you know, we've been working on this podcast behind the scenes for a, lo scenes for a long time. And that's why it finally um came to fruition when it was time and people are like you know i really love this you can do this with other things and i said i do too and you just have to remember that it's okay to pivot you can pivot um on that note is there anything that you really just in your heart of hearts would love to do but you know it's just not ever going to be possible because of the long-term aging factor yeah, we had to give up on pigs. <clears throat> we did want to have a pig operation, and I just think, given the, where it was going to have to be placed, uh, just going all the way over there every day with, with 
grain, well, with feed and water and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's just we had to put a kibosh on that. Um, uh, it's going to, yeah, I mean, I think that's about it, actually. I mean, you know, our, our ambition is meat, birds, lambs, laying operation, uh, milking does goat yoga. I mean, that's, we're, we're pretty and, and I feel good like with that. people will be like, oh, well, you know, what if, if you have 50 acres, why not cattle? You have 50 acres, why not have 50 lambs or whatever? And I think Can I speak to that? Yes. <laughs> yes. We are we are still the silvo pasture. Uh, and we're on the side of a mountain. So yeah, we have 50 acres, but a whole bunch of it is vertical. Uh, so it is it is not it is not reachable by any reasonable means. Uh, so the amount of area that we have that can really be, uh, that's, that's pasture or could be turned into silvo pasture is actually a, a fraction of that. So it's definitely not 50. We're not on 50 acres in the Hudson River Valley that's like, you know, rolling and yep. beautiful. We're, we're and, on the side of a mountain at 1150 feet. And people need to realize when buying land and you think, oh, I'm 30. Well, think about when you're 65 and you do have you know, somebody tells you, oh, yeah, goats can be on the mountainside. What happens if a goat goes down in that pasture on yeah. that mountainside? You know, so these are all good things, solid points. I love that you've you've literally brought up so many things and things I've been thinking about myself. And uh, so what advice do you have for people in their 20s and 30s who are ambitious, eager? What is like, listen, trust me, I've learned. What do we need to do? Wow. Um, <laughs> I know. I know. I'm <laughs> ending on a high I mean, note. I, yeah, no, well, what I would say is when I was in my 20s and 30s, and this is going to sound absolutely horrible, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I didn't think about money ever. Uh, I w it was beneath me. Uh, you know, it, I was just going to do my thing and, you know, I, whatever, 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 and I could just make it happen and all that kind of stuff. And I'm so glad that I used to be like that. Um, but now that I'm older, you know, I've just come to realize that there are things that I need and want, like, oh, I don't know, health insurance, like, oh, I don't know, high blood pressure medication. Yeah. Like, you know, but just really just you know, making sure that I can take care of myself and that we can take care of each other and we can take care of our animals um, has made us exceedingly fiscally conservative, um, where we're really, really, really careful. And I know everyone is, but, like, just – really looking at financial planning and just saying, okay, so what do I need X day so that on Y day I'm not eating cat food, you know, or yep. et cetera, et cetera, you know, or, you know, again, when I was younger, because I didn't think of money, that was not my focus. And I'm, again, I'm so grateful for that. Uh, uh, and, you know, sometimes <laughs> I was eating ramen noodles, but fine. But also just so that when the things happen that are going to knock you sideways, it's not going to make you go out of business as a farm, Yes. right? So I've been a small business owner for 30 years now, and, you know, these things are essential because um, stuff's going to happen. I mean, you know, COVID's going to happen. Something's going to close you down, or you're going to get sick, or something's going to be, and if you suddenly need, a, you know, a repair on the blah, blah, blah that's going to cost how much ever money, you don't want that to knock you off kilter because what I've seen some – Dear friends of mine are, are really struggling right now, and what I've seen is there was one kind of thing that happened that caused them to have to make choices that were not optimal for their farm, Yeah, and that kept them on this terrible downward spiral that choice after choice after choice, it was just sort of like a boulder going downhill, and it just gained momentum. Um, and I just think that, you know, what you, you really want to try to do is just have enough so that you're you're stable enough so that you can absorb the blows because they will come. It's life. Life on this planet is gorgeous, but it also, you know, it can knock you sideways. So. Yeah. And we are experiencing that, you know, I also uh. have been a small business owner for many years and yep. I'm young and started young. And, um, you know, people hear, well, you have a cleaning business and they assume I have all this money. Um, well, I had a cleaning business when I started it in um it was two locations one of which was the city another one was a very large town and it's all relative because we dumped a lot of money into our property 
you know, we started another location. We're doing all these things. And then snowball. Ah. Um, and once I got sick, I couldn't catch the snowball. Ah. And it just went and went and went and went. And then, so, I mean, for most of 2021, holy guacamole. Like, uh-huh. it was just always something, you know, 2022, that means we went into it with always something. And uh-huh. um, so people just... If you're young and able-bodied to work and healthy, definitely put in the time, put in the hours, get that stuff done, set money aside. And when you are, I heard somebody say this one time, and now I'm going to, you know, I'm trying to be focusing on that for the future. It says, if you can't buy something twice, you can't afford it. Mm. Yep. So I'm thinking, okay, you know, we're trying to apply that now. Little, little late, but better late than never, right? So if you're 20s and 30s and you want to do all these farm businesses, get your infrastructure and stuff done now. Do it now while you can get thinking, get moving, get stuff set back. Because what if you were to have triplets? You know, and then you couldn't work yeah. or, I mean, anything can happen. So that's just huge, excellent advice. Um, where would people go if they want to see the goat yoga? What if they want to, can they buy eggs? Where should they go? Well, <clears throat> we're in Woodstock and everything is winding down for the season and our chickens have not wound up their egg production as of yet. So we won't be, we won't have our next set of eggs until uh, next month, but Woodstock Goat Yoga has a lovely website, which is woodstockgoatyoga.com. Uh, classes ended last Saturday and will be starting up again uh, in May of next year. Um, and that's a great way of just getting in touch with us in general is that website. So woodstockgoatyoga.com. And I peaked, and I believe you have an Instagram. Yeah. We do. We have an Instagram and a TikTok, but I I have some. <laughs> I pay this lovely young woman twenty dollars an hour to post for me because I don't have any clue about any of that stuff, and I'm not going to pretend to. And I really, really tried, and I just was like, I don't like social media. I just can't stand it. And so she does all that for me. So all of those cute little videos were not made by me. She's wonderful. Yes, so. I do social media for other businesses. As well, I do, uh, especially the cleaning businesses, um, put yeah. their marketing together and do all that because they were not versed in that. And I've been doing it for years. So oh, that's amazing. Yes. I, so, can't, I, I can't make heads or tails of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I will link all of your stuff um, in on our page, as well as we have created a homestead podcast group because of high demand people were asking and asking so it is homestead happenings with vb podcast the group is on facebook you can search it and request it we will put everything in there you can contact all the speakers ask them questions do whatever you need to do um we so appreciate your time thank you so so much i hope that everybody listening feels comfortable that listen stop putting an expiration date on 50 you're still yeah. living. It is still <laughs> happening. I keep hearing it all the time. Let it go. You are doing great. And I think that um, I personally learned a lot and I got a lot, a lot of uh, solidification here when I'm like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to switch this out or move this or move that. And I think that this has been very informative. So I appreciate that so much. I will link all of your things. Hopefully everybody will go there. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And on that note, let's learn, let's grow, let's go. Thank you.